Hey, we're live. Hi. <laughs> Welcome to Ricktober. Oh, it Rick-tober. is Ricktober. <laughs> October tooth today. It's the tooth of October. And this is your month. Not the first, it's the tooth. This is like your month. This, this is, is Rick, this is the beginning of the entire holiday season. You got Ricktober. You were born in October. I was born in October. We were married in October. We have Halloween in October. I mean, All Hallows Eve. Of course. Followed by All Saints Day, November 1st. Followed by your birthday in November. Followed by Thanksgiving. Followed by Christmas. Followed by New Year's uh, Eve and New so Year's Day. So it's just day. like one after the other. I mean, this, the, the holiday is like, season is on. <laughs> Hi, Samuel. Hey, Jolene. Polly. Welcome to Eat Church. Got a question for you guys. Now, I got, first I got I got something to tell you before I ask you the question. What are you gonna the, tell me? The first thing I got to tell you is share the video so other people, will, your your friends, will come and join you on Eat Church tonight. Yeah, be like everybody come. No, let everybody come. We don't discriminate too much. We want your unsaved loved ones, your unloved saved ones. Hey, there's Mandy. Mandy, we we want to get to go and see you. She's in Melbourne. Melbourne, that's yeah. not far. I didn't even, yeah, I that forget. That is not far. No, so we want to, we're going to, we want to. Fit her into our forget. holiday season. It is the holiday season. <laughs> it's a October, November, three month holiday season. <laughs> <laughs> when you have 12 months. Kathleen. Three months. Iris. Isn't this cool? People from all over the place. Um, okay, so that's one thing I wanted to say was share the video so people will watch it. Okay. And. Um, Hi, Jolene. <laughs> and the question is this. What is the question? If there were no consequences for sin or bad behavior, if there were no... I don't think I'll, I'll just say consequences. And I'm not saying that there's not. I, I, we know there is consequences for sin. I mean, just a, any stupid decision you make <laughs> can have bad consequences and you live with them. Um, but if there wasn't, if there were no um, no penalty, okay? If there were no damnation because of sin, if there were no fear of hell, if there were no fear of disappointing God, if there were no... If there, if, if, if there were no fear of God being uh, angry or disappointed or, or bringing punishment upon sin, and I'm not saying that there's not, I'm just saying if there weren't, would you live an exemplary life? Would you live a biblical life, a godly life, let's say, uh, would you do that anyway if you didn't have if you didn't have that prod of uh, if you had no preacher telling you you need to step up and live better <laughs> if you had um, nothing telling you to live right to do well to love people to give to you know all the good things if we didn't have a doctrine telling us to do those things, would you still do them? Would you? I think so, but what? Well, maybe I wouldn't know. Like, what? Maybe I would. Because it's a theoretical question, I guess. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's hard to answer. The reason I ask it is this: is because the, the point I want to make tonight is this: that through the years of my personal walk with God, um, I've grown in relationship with him. I've grown in knowing him personally, very much more, much more intimately as we, uh, as I have grown and come to know him more. And I can honestly say that if nobody ever told me to do right, I think it would happen anyway. <laughs> I think I would still love people. I think I would still, um, make choices that, uh, that I normally make today, uh, choices of um, 
more honorable choices, more humble choices, things like that. I think I would still, in fact, I believe firmly that I still would because I don't even, the, the, the law or penalties don't, don't ever come into my mind anyway in my day-to-day -day walk. That's what you're saying. Whereas, you're right, whereas they used to, where it used to be, that was my impetus, was that, was that I want to do right because I want God to bless me. And I don't want to do wrong because I don't want to pay a penalty for it. Now, those things never enter into my mind. They just, that's just a fact. They just don't. And that has to have been because of the growth and, and coming to know God personally and knowing the kind of love that really changes the heart. I mean, because that's, that's, that's really what the whole thing was about with Jesus coming. He didn't come just to give us um, more rules of behavior. We had, you know, uh, what, 700, 800, how many laws are there in the Old Testament? We had a thick book of, of behavioral rules and Jesus didn't come to say, well, here's some more behavioral rules. We, we needed a heart change. Right. We needed him. We needed his life um, in us. And so that's what the new birth, the new creation is really all about, right? So, so what he did was he came and, and changed our hearts. What has gotten in the way is, 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 you know, is that the heart change is why our lives are different. But what has gotten in the way is that we've made what to do the bigger issue, and it's and it's overshadowed the why we do what we do. Most 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 Christians are happy if you just if you quit bad behavior, um, even if it's just because the Bible says so, or just because um, God wants you to, or you know. God will be happy if you do, or God will be mad if you don't. Um, most Christians are happy to let those be sufficient reasons for people's lives to change. Um, that's why many people put the pressure of, of, of religion and dogma on people to try to get them to change, either for their will or simply because they believe they have this thing about uh, wanting everybody to live up to a certain standard. And so we hold that standard. And that, and that in itself really is the thing that most Christians operate in is they, they have a set standard that somehow they've pulled together from all their information, from things they've read, from things that they've heard, from things that have been preached, from, uh, and often from traditions that have just come to them that they've, that they've taken cliches often that they've taken, and they've somehow taken all that information and they have a certain standard that they're to live up to. Mm -hmm. And for most Christians, it's, uh, while some of them, it's a fear of something, while others, it's a promise of, of, of a reward if they do, most Christians, I believe, are just that there's a standard that's expected, that God expects of them, and they're, and, 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 because that they see a standard that's been given, that's their motivation, is to live up to that certain standard for whatever reasons God has for giving us that standard. What if there wasn't a standard? What if there was no standard written? What if we could never pull any scriptures together and build a standard of living for the modern day American Christian? What would our lives be like? Would they really be chaotic? Now we're talking about you've got a relationship, You've got, a, you've got the Holy Spirit in you. You've got your counselor. You've got God who is love living inside you. You've got a new nature. You have all that. What if there, there was no standard that was presented from scriptures that we, that we have in the word of God? What would our lives look like? Would they, would they, would they look godly or would they look demonic? What do you think? I think if you really have the Holy Spirit, they wouldn't, it couldn't help but look godly. Right, because the Holy Spirit is the new nature in us. It'd be like Adam and Eve before the fall. Yeah, before before we went after the flesh. <laughs> right. Before we, before we put our mind on the things of the flesh rather than the things of the Spirit. And aren't, and, and these standards that we, that, that, We've, we've put together 
Those are all things for our flesh to do. Right. They all have to do with with the flesh. And and most of us as Christians, we're satisfied if we see someone's flesh live up to that. Mm -hmm. For instance, you know, we were uh, talking about, you know, sexuality and, 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 you know, most Christians would, would, um, would be satisfied if we told someone, this is the rule of sexuality that is spelled out in the Bible. Now do that. And let's say they do that. Mm -hmm. And so they abstain from any sexual vice at all that we know of. But they're doing it because they, they, they believe the Bible tells them to, or we told them to, or the preacher told them to, or something told them to be that way. But yet inwardly, they still have not been changed. Inwardly, they still lust. Inwardly, they still they still desire. So this is why so many church people are involved in secret things. Because outwardly, we know that we're acceptable if we look a certain way and everybody's happy with us and they don't know the secret things that we're doing. They don't know that we're looking at pornography. They don't know that we're having affairs. They don't know that we're, uh, you know, got all these other things going on in our head but outwardly, we're looking good, and so we're accepted. But inwardly, we still are hungry, we still are hurting, we're still dysfunctional, and we still need a work to be done. But as long as we're outwardly abstaining from certain things, it's fine, it's okay. And Jesus never was, was good enough with that because he would say, okay, so you haven't killed your neighbor. You haven't physically taken his, his, his mortal life but you've hated him. You felt like it. You, you wish he was dead. <laughs> you know? He says, but it, you hated him in your heart. He says, it's the same thing because he would get to the heart thing. So you haven't actually murdered someone. You haven't actually committed the crime that would send you to prison, but in your heart, it's just as bad. He says, because you still have that ugliness of murder in you. So Jesus would always get to the heart change. He would say, so you haven't committed adultery. <laughs> But you've got that wish and that want to. You still got all this 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 um, selfishness going on that makes you want, and it causes you not to be able to love your wife properly. It causes you not to relate to her properly. But you're but you've remained faithful to her because the Bible tells you to. You've remained faithful to her because you're afraid that it'll ruin your family if you if you're if you're not. Now those are reasons, but what if there's what if the reason is my heart is full of love? I love my wife, and I would never do that because I just love her. Mm -hmm. Isn't that a better reason than well, she'll kill me if I ever you know if I ever cheated on her or something like that, or it would it would it would hurt the kids or you know whatever. Those are all carnal reasons to change a carnal activity. Mm -hmm. But Jesus always got. To the heart, I want to. I want to make sure um, I don't miss some good uh, comments here. Um, Amber says, "Fear of failing God by poor choices and knowingly making them, but sometimes unable to redirect." I pray for redirection and wisdom all the time. Oh, and forgiveness, always forgiveness. Well, we got some good news, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> Number one, there is always forgiveness, and it's automatic because of the blood of Jesus, right? Yeah. And and another thing is we don't ever have to fear a failing God um, because, honestly, you can't fail God. He already knows your frame, knows your weaknesses, knows your failures, even before you fail those failures. Uh, so he's already made plenty of room for that in this salvation. Isn't it great that this salvation is so big that there's plenty of room for falling? Mm -hmm. There's plenty of room for failure. There's plenty of room... There, and this is what's scary to people. There's plenty of room for sin. And everybody that says they're not are people that are committing sins <laughs> in some form or another. Um, but there again, they, 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 they form their own standard and they make the standard, well, at least I'm trying or at least I confess it. Um, I can get off on that one for a long time. People, the idea that I can that 
if I confess it, um, then it becomes okay. That actually fuels repeated negative activity. Because the truth is, you know, I'm tempted to do something there tomorrow, and I know it's not right, and I don't want to, but, oh gosh, the pull is so strong. But if I just confess it, if I go confess it, then God will be faithful to forgive me of it. So, it, see, it gives me an out to continue to, 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 to fail. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, a, it's much better when you look at the reality of God and, and this new covenant and the grace of God and say, there's already room to fail in this. And, but the why that we, that we live the way we do is because his love is more than enough for us. And it's not about, it's not about our, our failures or our successes. What is it? That's flesh, right? Mm -hmm. Our failures or our successes. So what God has done in his new covenant is nothing about that. It's nothing about our performances, behavior, or activity. The salvation is about the relationship, him becoming one with us. And it's that oneness and knowing that relationship and operating from that place of unity and relationship with somebody that's totally in love with you is what, is what brings about the good actions, what brings about the, what uh, I, I would call automatic holiness. Because you are loved, you have love to give. Because you've received mercy, you have mercy to give. Because you have received the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, kindness, faith, perseverance, self-control. Mm -hmm. those, are, those are the what's that happen because of the why, God loving you, Christ in you. So it's all about the heart. And, that's the, and, 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 and that points out the fallacy of making it about behavior. We, Christians are so afraid that somebody's going to do wrong behavior as if it's not happening every day. Okay, so Amber's asking, but isn't knowingly having an out and doing it anyway, isn't that a sin anyway? So in other words, I yeah, could say, well, I is. can confess it later, or I could say, well, God loves me so much, so mm -hmm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give in to this mm -hmm. sin anyway. Yep. But what, you're, what I think I'm hearing you say is that it's your relationship. So if you're trying to find an out, you're going to find an out. You're going to find an out. Whatever, whether it's, well, God's love's big enough for it, or I can just confess it, whatever. But it's that growing in the relationship. If, exactly, yeah. Because the, the big thing that comes up is I just, in, just I telling anybody. people that they love them. What about those who say, well, God loves me, so I'm just going to do this ugly thing. Right. That's what we hear all well, the time. Well, and I and what I say is, go ahead. I got nothing for you. Go do it and be stupid, <laughs> and do the ugly thing and feel real bad about it and 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 hurt yourself and hurt hurt others with whatever it is that you like to do, and do those things and go ahead and be bound to it and go ahead and be bound to something you can't quit. If that's what you want to do, then I got nothing for you. If you want if 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 you want a change of life, if you want a change of heart, um, if you want a life that's fulfilling. If you want to be happy in life, if you want to, if you want to um, have a life and a heart that's finally fulfilled, then then come to me and let's talk about the real love of God that fulfills a heart and change your life. That other idea is simply a doctrine. That uh, that kind of love is simply a doctrine of well, God loves me, and there's and it goes no further. God loves me. It's just doctrinal. It's not relational. It's just doctrinal. God's up there. He loves me, so everything, everything's, uh, uh, everything that I do is okay. Well, for one thing, that's stupid. Uh, anybody should know that not everything a, a person can do is okay. We messed this up very early on in the Bible, right? In Genesis chapter three, um, and so, uh, so, so that, that, that's all there is to, to that. But God will still love people in their bad choices. Now, on the other side of that, um, if what you're, if what you're looking for is simply to have perfect behavior, I don't know that I've got anything for that either. What I do have is a relationship that's fulfilling. What I do have is, 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 is what I found is the one thing that will fill your hungry soul. The one thing that will satisfy 
your thirsty heart. The one thing that will answer all the questions of everything you've ever wanted and all the whys and why nots. And, the, and, and, and if you want a real joy, an everlasting joy, not a temporary happiness of, of, of sin, but if you want a real joy that'll last you and see you through anything and everything this old world has to throw at you, then I got something for you. And that is the love of God. It's a real love of God because love's a person. He's not a doctrine. So you're not talking about a doctrine of God's love. You're talking about mm -mm. growing in a personal one-on-one -on -one right. relationship with someone. And, that's, and, and that needs to be known because this is the argument you get is people start arguing about the doctrine of love. They, they, they feel like, well, the doctrine of love is not enough. No, a doctrine of anything is not enough. But it's, it's the reality of that love. The thing about it is, though, we have to declare <laughs> that mm. doctrine or that truth, if you will, because that's the truth. People need to hear it and know it. And what, you know, what, what I'm seeing over my next year, it'll be 40 years that I've um, walked strong with the Lord. 40 years. And what I've seen over those years is that. There's so little real love relationship. Let's bring it down to where maybe people can understand it. There again, let's use the, uh, the husband and wife, the couple thing, and, and, and the adultery thing. Because I love you, that idea of doing anything like that is just a million miles away. If I didn't love you, then my mind's going other places. Now I'm tempted. Now I'm tempted. Maybe some. Maybe maybe I'll get love somewhere else. Maybe somebody else will give me what I need. Maybe somebody else will give me the attention. Maybe I can get it from these other things that I can be involved in. And so so. And but then you don't want to do it. So you'll use guilt. You'll use um, the pressure of uh, punishment or consequences of it. And that will be. That would be my only motivation to be faithful to you, but my heart still is not a heart of love. Mm -hmm. So I remain faithful, but the reality, the, the love, the relationship is not there. And that's how it is with God. We, when we try to use the, the fear and the punishment and all that, you can get someone to outwardly remain faithful to God, but they don't have the fulfillment and the beauty of a relationship of love that just makes it automatic and you don't have to try and, 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 and um, it, it's, 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 it's essentially effortless. And so that's why I don't talk all the time about, about trying to please God because there is a place. There is a, there, let me say, not only want to say there's a place because this is simple. Because when I say there's a place, now people think it's the mystical, faraway thing that I got to journey into. You're in that place. Mm -hmm. God loves you right here, right now, just the way that you are while you were yet a sinner <laughs> and still does. If you still sin, he loves you, gave his life for you. And Jesus is and was and always will be more than enough for you and for all of that. Now that that's out of the way, enjoy the love of God. Without, we really need to get those basic elements that Hebrews 6 talks about, judgment and repentance from dead works. And I was thinking, move on from that and get into the beauty of this perfection, of this relationship with God. When we bring in the behavior thing, you know what that does? It makes us conscious of the sin. That's called sin consciousness. That's an acknowledgement of sin. It's an acknowledgement of flesh and weakness. The Bible says in all of your ways, which can be weak, <laughs> which can be imperfect, which can fail, <laughs> which can sin. But in all of your ways, acknowledge him, not how horrible you are, not how bad you fail, not how, not how you don't measure up, not how you, you're less than the standard. Acknowledge him. 
Because when your focus is on him, then he keeps you in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. The standard is what Jesus has done and, and, and the standard is now met. That's Romans chapter 8. So there's no standard for you to live up to. But when you, but when you receive this free gift of grace and this unconditional love, and please let it be unconditional. Please let it be with no conditions because any conditions you put on it will bring you back into the flesh. Let this grace be amazing. Don't let it have caveats. If it's not amazing, then it'll be then, it, then it'll be made less than amazing by your weakness in your flesh. And 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 read Romans eight. Paul is so clear about that about putting your attention on the things of the flesh. That's your weaknesses. Our our attention is on Him who's crowned with glory and honor. Our attention is on the perfect sacrifice. I love that John the Baptist told us, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He didn't say, look in the mirror. He didn't say, look at yourself. He didn't say, look at your sin. Look at your failures, your flaws, your weaknesses. Mm -hmm. You look at them. Do we have them? Yes, we do. But that's not our gospel. Our gospel is Jesus. It's not about us. Mm -hmm. Any other comments or anything or questions? That so we Amber said, I'm gentle in nature, a people pleaser, you could say. I feel like when I hurt people, I hurt God. I don't even know where I'm going with this. She says, I'm going to, I'm going into silent watch mode. She says, but I, no. but I think she's looking at oh. where she falls short and, and she puts it that I must hurt God in, when I fall short. You know, that comes from, and please don't go into silent mode because your questions and your comments are good and other people, are, like, yeah. and other people relate to this. This is not strange at all. Um, that but that comes from <clears throat> ideas, doctrines, traditions, or or even or or anything else <clears throat> that put upon us a fear of failing God. Uh, I remember hearing those those, those messages, and, and 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 even when people talk about relationship, they they can get it wrong with this, where they're like, where they're where they're where they'll say. It's not because it'll hurt you, but it'll hurt the heart of God. You know, and who wants to be the person on earth who's hurting the heart of God, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the truth is, love is not easily hurt. That's 1 Corinthians 13. Love is big enough to embrace somebody that's hurtful. Love is big enough to embrace the unlovable and the unlovely. That's, that's God. He's not a man. And, and his, his heart is so big and so perfect and so strong. It was big enough that he could wrap his arms around the world and love the whole world. So he came and took care of the whole issue of sin, please, once and for all. So, but then we go to, yeah, but I still still want to please him or I still want to do what I want to be pleasing in his sight and I don't want to be unpleasing in his sight. Well, that's fine, but understand that God understands and God knows our frame and God made us weak and foolish vessels. That's Bible. And he did not make us perfect and he did not make us to attain perfection in our behavior. He revealed to us that he and only he can is and can be our only perfection. It has nothing to do with us. So what we do is we rejoice in the free gift of righteousness. We rejoice in that free gift and we enjoy it. Like the prodigal son who had done everything wrong, had squandered his daddy's money, and I'm sure it made daddy sad that, that his boy was out there suffering like that. But, but when, he, when, when he came home, daddy showed, and, he, and daddy is the hero in this, not the son. <laughs> daddy showed that he had never lost his love for him, not for one moment. And he ran to him and he embraced him and he threw him a party. And the prodigal son who knew he had done nothing but wrong began to enjoy the party because his daddy was that good to him. 
So I say, enjoy this gift of righteousness and, and, and watch, watch, just watch that work. The other thing has never worked. The fear, the condemnation, the judgment, the pressure, the manipulation, none of those things have worked and they will not work. Yeah, they work kind of on a superficial level. on a To a degree, level, only to a degree. Level. But it's kind of what Jesus came for was that the heart of the people, not the outward behavior. If, if it was just for the outward behaviors, the Pharisees were all winning. They were all doing great. And outward behavior makes nobody free. Outward behavior is, is not a free heart. A free heart is full of joy. A free heart is full of peace and is full of love. And it's, the, and, it's, and it's that freedom of the heart that allows us to live this thing called abundant life. We live out of that reality. That's the why. Why do we do what we do? Why, why do I live a life where I... Why do I even preach? Why do I even minister? You know, there's a lot better ways of making money than preaching the gospel. <laughs> so if it's just about an occupation and about money, there's a whole lot better. I could make a whole lot more money doing something else besides this. Why do I do it? You say, well, you're called. Well, why would I obey that call? It's not even so much that I, would, that I think God would not be pleased. I think God would still love me if I didn't do it. I think God would still bless me if I didn't do it. Because that's how I know him. That is, mm. but how can I not? When I found something this good, how can I not tell people how good this is? When I have searched all of my, my life, and most of it has been as a Christian, as a believer, when I have searched for fulfillment, when I have searched for holiness, when I have searched and, and, and strived for that, to walk in that high standard, and I found that what I was trying for, I already had in him. And it changed everything about my existence. It finally made the hungry, starving believer full of joy and full of peace and full of love. Mm -hmm. How would I not share that? It's not because God would punish me if I don't. And it's not because God will reward me because I do. It's just how do I not? See, it's the why. Why do we do? The why is, is the love. The why is the relationship. Then the why is enough. And the why then does produce the what. So that's why I obey the call. That's why I preach. That's why I love. I don't love my wife because God will be mad if I don't. I love my wife because I've been given love. I have received love and I have, I have a love to give. And that love that we received takes away every need of selfishness because that is the relationship that fulfills that age-old hungry heart. And you don't have to fight for you. You don't have to defend you. You don't have to get you. You don't have to worry about you. You don't have to stress about you. You don't have to be frustrated about you. You don't have to be afraid about you anymore. The heart is full. Welcome to heaven on earth. Welcome to the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. A good comment from uh, Mike. Mike Henderson. He says, God still loved David when he slept with Bathsheba. But since David had an intimate relationship with God, it hurt David as much as it hurt God. David genuinely repented and God restored him since this was an authentic relationship. David paid dearly with the loss of his son, but David's relationship with God was brought closer and more intimate, the flawed being loved by the perfection of love. Right, and, and, and that's a true story. And, and David, you know, David's name actually means loving in Hebrew. It means loving. David means loving. And, and he really did have that edge more than some more than many other people that we read about of the patriarchs of the Old Testament uh, more of that love for God that's why it was called a man after God's own heart the cool thing about it though is we're new covenant people and Jesus said the greatest in the in the kingdom of heaven excuse me the least in the kingdom of heaven 
And that could be somebody watching. It could be me. <laughs> the least in the kingdom is greater than the greatest uh, of the old. Uh, in fact, the way he said it was, you know, no man, uh, John the Baptist was greater of every man that was ever born of a, of a woman. But he that's in the kingdom, the least that's in the kingdom is greater than John, greater than the greatest. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have even something better than that. David was a hungry man after, 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 after God's own heart, hungering for this thing that the new covenant uh, could bring. We had the new covenant. And, and the reason that we share what we do, and, and the reason I wanted to come on each church tonight, is because, because my brothers and sisters in Christ have been so distracted and derailed by all these traditions and cliches and fears and punishments and, and all these things that get in the way um, and while there's mention of those things in the Bible, they're missing the main thing. And, and, and the main thing is this relationship of this unconditional love of God and how he loves us and how Jesus is enough and how that fills, fills the heart of man. The Bible is so clear about that. And so, yeah, there's a lot of things we can talk about in the Bible, but let's establish the main thing first. The Bible says, let your heart be established, established in his love. Because when you understand the love, or excuse me, when you, when you can comprehend the love of God that, that passes earthly knowledge, you're then filled with the fullness of God. And that's what God wanted. He wanted our hungry hearts fulfilled. It wasn't the behavior. No. The wonderful thing is now the fill, the fulfilled heart has much better behavior <laughs> automatically. And it doesn't need rules to do it. Mm -hmm. I go back to the question. What if there were no rules? What if the Bible didn't say don't do it? Would you still do it? Mm -hmm. What if the Bible didn't say um, don't commit adultery? Would you just go out and do it because the Bible doesn't mention it? Or would you have a love that would keep you from it? What if the Bible never mentioned stealing? What if the Bible never mentioned any, anything that, that we know is a sin? Mm -hmm. Would we still do it just because the Bible doesn't say don't do it? Now here's something I've been thinking about lately is uh, how Jesus interacted with the woman caught in adultery, the Zacchaeus who was a thief and, and tax collector, and the woman at the well who was living with a guy and you know been with five guys. There's no record of him sitting down with them and explaining what you're doing is wrong. This behavior is unacceptable. I need to let you know that this is not the standard that I'm coming for. It was like he just enjoyed them. He just loved them. He just interacted with them. He just he partied did. with them, sat with them, loved on them, and they automatically were filled to the point of, um, you know, changing, changing a transformation. It, he related with them. Yeah. There's it's, no record of it. We don't know what Jesus said in the house with Zacchaeus when, you know, they were all eating, but surely his disciples would have recorded. It that. had to have been mostly small talk because if he had said some kind of profound confrontation, they would have, that would have been the headline yeah. <laughs> of the story. That would and have been the point. <laughs> I think what's ups uh, it's not upsetting, but it's, it's hard is to watch people put the what before the why yeah. is, is to say, okay, I have a, a the behavior, you know, a, a person in my life who's doing this wrong behavior and I know that, you know, God wouldn't be pleased with that or it's not their best, you know, it's not their best. So I need to talk to him about it or even how people deal with themselves. I made a, a mistake. I treated this person poorly. I have, like Amber said, I've disappointed God. I, I, it's almost like I need to have this self-flagellation. You know, I've got to, I've got to feel really horrible about it or else I'll do it again or there has to be some sort of which payment you, that, which you do on. anyway <laughs> but the thing about it is is what if I just received got into my home you know what if I just sat down with them and That's say good. okay I, I messed up here what do you say about me and you and you really sense 
God's saying, yet while you're a sinner, yet while you're sinning right now, I love you. I've come for you. I'm here for you. I, I, I want the best for you. And, and what if we, what if we just went a different path than the self-flagellation path? What if we just turned and said, no, I, I, I'm going to go with God seeing me, loving me, um, encouraging me, you know what I'm saying? As opposed to, um, you know, let me give myself a timeout. Let me have a, a little spanking on myself so that I'll, I'll learn. I mean, it works for babies, but we're not babies. You know what I'm saying? We're, we're a little more mature. I like that illustration that. when you were just saying that. I was thinking, okay, what if, what if you receive Jesus into your house and you're really, you're really nervous because you have really let him down. He had you watching his puppy and you didn't do a good job and the puppy got away oh. and you don't know where it's at. And Jesus comes, comes in and you're like, what am I going to tell? And he comes in and all he starts talking about is how much he loves you and how wonderful it is for him to spit, to, to see you. And, and, and he starts talking to you about all these things about you that he loves and all that. And you just, you're having this good time and you're feeling so good. And you say, uh, Jesus, I, I need to tell you something. And, and he's just like, yeah, what? and you finally, you get it in. You, you, you tell him and, and he hears you and you see, he says, you know, I lost your dog and I don't know where it's at. And oh, I'm so sorry. And he looks at you and he goes, Oh, and I love that dress you're wearing too. And you, <laughs> And, and, and why would he do that? You say, because he thinks he puts you way up here and the things way down there. And how well you do things are way down there. It's you that he died for, not your performance. He didn't die for your potential. He died for you, your now, while you were still a sinner. And we've taken on these cliches that make Jesus look like less than what he is. We say, we say, Jesus doesn't love us the way we are. He loves us in spite of the way we are. Now, that is a total twisted idea that on purpose, it brings it back to our ugliness and our unworthiness, and it de delineates and demeans the beautiful, powerful sacrifice of Jesus and the perfect blood of Jesus and the perfect love that shed that blood. And, and, and so it puts it back on you. Don't behold you, behold the lamb. And so, so, so there it is when you say, and, and while that could be a true statement on the surface, he doesn't love us the way we are. He loves us in spite of how we are. What's that telling you? All you gotta do is say that. He loves us in spite of how we are. What does that do? Your attention is going on you, on how you are, in spite of how, now what are you thinking about? Yeah, all the ways you fall short. Now what are you thinking about? Yeah, all the ugly things that you've done. In spite of, in spite of, in spite of, in spite of, in spite of. And all those things come up when Jesus has put them in the sea of forgetfulness. When Jesus has already removed them as far as the east is from the west, but we're still talking about in spite of how we are. Mm -hmm. You see that? Mm -hmm. You see what that does? The, 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 <laughs> the enemy of your soul is so deceitful and comes as a messenger of light, mm -hmm. but it brings all of this, this, this fear and condemnation, self-flagellation, self-disappointment, all of these things. The Bible says in Colossians 2, don't let anybody rob you of your reward, of abundant life, of favor, of righteousness, and all those things. He says, by, by the traditions of men. And so many of these religious cliches, if they make you feel unrighteous, unholy, not complete, not measuring up, if though any of those traditions make you feel like that, they are not part of the new, gospel, new covenant. They're not a part of the gospel. They are not the word of God. As a believer in Christ, as someone who has received the spirit, who is a new creation, is a child of God and is a father. And God is your father, a loving father. That's what Jesus revealed to us. He's not, ju he's not your, just your boss. He's not just your judge. He's not just, most, most, so many Christians see him primarily as a judge. He's daddy. They see him primarily as the boss, the master. He's daddy. The prodigal son wanted to make him a master. He said, huh, I ain't gonna be your master. I'm still gonna be daddy. <laughs> 
yeah, but daddy, I did this. I'm not worried that he'll be called your son. Well, he started making him feel pretty worthy just by how the father loved him. That love convinced the prodigal son and that, and, 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 you know, I don't see the prodigal son, um, arguing with his dad much more after that. After he says that, the father just kept loving him and, 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 and bestowing goodness on him. And pretty soon that's when the repentance happened. It didn't happen while he was in the pig pen. Mm -hmm. The repentance happened when his mind changed about his daddy. And when his mind changed about his daddy, that's when the prodigal son got to enjoy the party. Even after being such an ugly sinner like he has been, he got to enjoy the party. And it doesn't say he was a perfect person after that. In fact, I'll bet you a jillion, because I don't have a million, but I can bet a jillion. <laughs> what is a jillion? That he it wasn't perfect after mm -hmm. that. <laughs> right. But it doesn't change the father's love. The father is the hero in our story, not us. Yeah. I think it's, it's really a lot of the matter of trusting God, trusting his goodness. I mean, because yeah. what we've, done in the past is really trusted um, our, our, ourselves, our focus on ourselves. If we feel bad enough, we won't do these things. And, and to really trust his love and his, his being good to us, even uh, when our what doesn't really yeah, reflect and, 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 I, and, I, and I feel like you, the word trust, that trusting it is like the first step to, to, to getting, because sometimes it's like, at first, it's like a blind trust. It's like, okay, this is how God is. I really know this at the core of my being. I still got head troubles here with all this. Some of this religion and tradition is messing me up. But I'm going to trust that God loves me, that his grace is enough, that God is good, and he, and he wants the best for me. And what happens is as you, as you do that, as you trust that, you, you move into the reality of this all-fulfilling Union relationship with God who is finally to you more than enough. And you'll find, you'll feel like you're living a dream and you will find that rest for your soul and you will find that fulfillment once and for all. And all those other things are so far back in line. The behavior is not your major thing anymore though your behavior has changed completely. Mm, that's good. Susan uh, Alexander said, Amen. Amen, Susan. And my favorite high school teacher is watching, Mr. Heberling. Hey, Paul. <laughs> he said, Hi, Rick and Judy. And Ricky Willingham said, Really blessed by this ministry. I am so glad to hear things like that, you know. Kara... Kara, Kara says, the father didn't let his son grovel. He celebrated him and restored his position and value immediately. Good point. He's not looking for groveling. And he's not holding out, waiting for us to, this thing about, well, if we, if we repent. What's that even mean? What? The word repent. People say, well, if we repent, God wants us to repent. And, and so... You know, there's these wrong definitions of that word for one thing, but people again have their own standard of what it means to repent. You know what I used to do with it because is I would because I used to think to repent meant that you confessed it, you admitted you were wrong, and promised to do better. But then, if I failed again at the same thing, which I often did, often did, then I thought, well, I must not have really repented. So now where am I left? Now I'm lost. I'm like, I don't know where I'm at. I don't know how to do this, but I got to find out how. Mm -hmm. And it becomes very, very hard because I'm convinced that if I, because we would say it, oh my goodness, how mean we could be in our ignorance. But we would say, if you really repent, you won't do it again. Right. And there, there we were. And I was one of those that found myself stumbling over the same thing. And, and, and you talk about not about meaning it. I would cry. Mm -hmm. I would groan out to God and cry and say, I mean it. I don't want to do this. I don't like it. <laughs> you know, like, how can you repent anymore? You know, mm -hmm. and, and, and I would do it again. So then, and when we say, if you really repent, you won't do it again. Mm -hmm. What's that do? That's putting it back on your ability again. That was all that was left. Right. 
because I had done what I thought the Bible said, and I had repented, and I had begged God for his help and, and everything, and, 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 I, and I, I still failed again, and, and, and now I'm a failure, and it's all because I wasn't able to follow up on my vow to not do it again mm -hmm. because my flesh was too weak and God was disappointed in me because of my weak flesh and I didn't live and I must not love him enough and I must not be sincere. And I'm like, well, I thought I was sincere. So now I'm lost trying to figure out where I was insincere. And I, and it's just, oh, it's just, it's horrible. Please throw all that stuff away <laughs> mm -hmm. and get back to what Paul called the simplicity of the gospel. Christ died for sinners of which you are chief. <laughs> mm, that's good. <laughs> Julie says, I like to think of how as a parent, I didn't think less of my children when they would mess up. They were learning. Even if they knew better, I think of God as being that way, understanding our frame. He is. And even better is a thing. The best earthly example that we can come up with, we can sort of give an idea, but whatever we say, he's even he, his love is even bigger and stronger than that. Mm -hmm. Cuista said, Happy Ricktober. Yes, mm -hmm. thank you. Happy Ricktober to everybody. It's here, guys. You've waited <laughs> for it all year. The holiday season has begun. Enjoy. Ricktober is a month of, of peace and love and joy. It's a month of no condemnation. It's a month of the manifestation of the kingdom of heaven. It's a month of, of, of the fruit of the spirit, bringing about all the peace and patience and the self-control. It's faith. <laughs> Expect Ricktober. The holidays have begun. God has, has given us the beginning of a, a, a celebration season. <laughs> <laughs> Thus saith Rick. Uh, uh, mm. That's good. I had something happen this, actually it was, a little while ago, but I had something where I felt like God was showing me that heart that had room for uh, sin, had, had room for it's, messing up. That's a, that is so big. So I had this situation with someone who's close to me who uh, got really angry with me and, and really they were having a hard time, but they took it out on me. And they were saying very mean things to me and ugly things that were very accusatory, very hurtful. And I remember sitting in the situation because it was me and just this person. And I was thinking to myself, I wanted to run out of the room, but I, did, I, I really didn't know what to do. So I'm sitting there and I'm like, Lord, what do I do? Like, what do I do? And uh, I just felt that I was too to sit there and this person went on and on and I was like my heart was beating really strong and I was shaking and I was really hurt by what was being said and uh and I, I would just respond periodically oh I, I didn't I didn't know you felt that way or you know um you know we're we're really glad you're 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 you know with us or you know just whatever came to mind and um I look back on it uh, and then, and then shortly you came home and we kind of worked out the whole situation, but I look back on it and I think, how did I do that? Because in my flesh, I want to, if someone's punching me, I want to punch him back, right? In my flesh, I want to return, uh, is it evil for evil? Mm -hmm. Or I want to return it and say, don't hurt me like that. Don't, don't treat me like that. Uh, but I I, I didn't. It was like I, I had room enough for this person's... Um, for their flaws. wrong, for their sins, yeah. for, their, for their flaws. And, and, and the thing about it was, I, I'm really glad I didn't respond. I, I, I'm glad I didn't respond negatively, and I'm glad I didn't run away. I'm glad I just stood there, and, and I almost feel like I'm, I'm glad I could take it, because I think it meant more to that person... It, it, Later, it, it, it does. Then, just, if I had just just like Jesus' love meant more to Zacchaeus, just like it meant something to, um, you know, the woman who was a harlot, or to the Samaritan woman, it means mm -hmm. so much to the person when you give it. And I, and I don't share it to kind of pat myself on the back or say, "Oh, I did this wonderful thing." I'm 
I'm in all of it. I'm mm -hmm. I'm in all of it because I know it wasn't. It's, it's the change. It's my the strength. growth. It's the. I know it's a a byproduct. Yeah. Of. It's the what of the why. Yeah, it's the why was there, so the what just happened. Happened in in. Uh, and that's a good point because see, and I and I because I, I wanted to bring this up uh, tonight is that this is so good because it's something we grow in, and our heart is growing. Remember the Grinch; his heart grew six sizes that day, <laughs> or some four sizes that day. You know, and you notice that in these in these times uh, where there's conflict or you know or different things, or or you you just really you just notice it in this world. Um, I find that my heart is much bigger for unlovable people. My heart is much bigger for for this crazy, ugly world right now. Mm -hmm. For the whole, with all the social issues and all the stuff going on, uh, with this, my, your heart gets bigger for the situations that you're in. That's growth. Um, you know, early on, there's you know all the situations overwhelmed my little capacity. But we grow in the love of God. That's what happens. Yeah. That's what growth is, is growing in his love. If you're not growing in his love, you're not growing. Mm -hmm. And 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 what happens is it just makes you happier for one thing, but it makes you better in all that way. It makes you where you can handle, just like he can, this old ugly world. Mm -hmm. and, and you can still love it. And your motives there again are not because somebody said it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. Your motive is love. Yeah. And that's all the motive. That is all, all, all the motive that you'll ever need. Yeah. So, just to tell on myself, honestly. <laughs> all right, I won't say anything more. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any other comments or questions? Hope this has been a blessing to you. Um, love covers a multitude of sin. You weren't standing alone. That's why you were able to face that. Yeah. True. Punch with love. <laughs> that, well, that, I like that. That right there. You weren't standing alone. Are you able to face that? That's another part of this. Is, is that's that's part of the simplicity of this. You will never be alone. You will always have help. You will always have someone who's a part of you now that makes it's bigger than, than this world and therefore it makes you bigger. You'll always have counsel. You'll always have guidance if you want it, if you want to listen to it. Now, as you become love motivated, you're more inclined to hear that voice of love talking. Uh, if you're sin motivated, behavior motivated, you know, religion motivated, then it's harder to hear that. Then you mess up. <laughs> mm -hmm. But, you know, that's how the Bible says, unto the pure, this is Psalms 18, 25, and 26, unto the pure, he shows himself pure. Uh, th those words mean unto the, unto the whole, he shows himself as complete. Uh, now, the only way we can be whole and pure is in the new covenant, in the blood of Jesus. That's why without that, even the Old Testament saints didn't get that. Uh, but in the but in the new, uh, the, the 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 purity and the wholeness and the holiness that comes from Jesus because of this gift of righteousness, we see God as whole and merciful. Uh, he says to the pure, he shows himself pure. To the merciful, he shows himself merciful. But to the froward, he shows himself froward. That word froward is the opposite of toward or toward which means to approach or come to. Froward means to turn from. And, uh, and, uh, and, and so those who are turning from, he, he shows himself that way. He's someone who's to be feared. He's someone who's a judge. He's someone who's a punisher. He's a condemner. And uh, that's the way you see him. That's how he is shown. But when you see who he really is, through his gift of love and righteousness, what you see is is the reality of God. You see His purity. You see His mercy. You see His goodness, uh, His unconditional love, and that that and that is the only thing that can change the heart. And that 
becomes the real why we do what we do and why we don't do certain things that we don't do. It's not because we're trying to make it to heaven. It's because we're in love. And it's because we're fulfilled. So um, those of you listening, you know, some of you will, will say, well, you know, I'm not there. That's exciting. That means you've got some room to grow. That means you've got a wonderful adventure of getting bigger inside. That means that some things that might be hard for you now won't be hard for you later on because we grow. We don't digress in this. We only grow in this. As long as you're hearing truth, uh, you'll, you, you grow in it. And that brings me to another point that I wanted to make before we sign off is it's not about trying hard because people are like, I'm trying to get this. I'm trying to believe it. I'm trying to make it real. I'm trying. Um, it is real. So rest in it. Try resting if you're going to try anything. Try not trying so hard and sit back and enjoy the love and enjoy the freedom and the no condemnation and let Jesus, I like how you said that earlier, receive him into your home. Let Jesus sit down and have a nice time with you. Let Jesus, if you're the, you know, if you're the sinful tax collector that was up in the tree, let Jesus say, come on, I want to party with you tonight. And you're sitting there all nervous, like, oh, he knows everything I've done. And all he does is just have a good time with you because he loves you and he loves being with you. In fact, he wanted to be with you so bad that he gave his life and took upon all the, all the, uh, the wages of sin upon himself so that he could be with you. in spite of <laughs> or because of his love for you. Say it that way. In spite of our, instead of saying he loves us in spite of our sin, say he loves us because of his love. Okay. Anything else? Um, Paul says, my love for Jesus has grown so much inside me that the world is falling apart and I'm still smiling and I'm still happy knowing Jesus loves me more. Well, thanks for watching guys. Thanks for partaking. And, uh, we, we you know, Hi, Kim and Michael. Hey guys, we, uh, we, we really appreciate the interaction and the comments. Um, yeah. for those of you that are, uh, new to, uh, to new friends of ours or new to our lives or our ministry, um, you can see more at rickmanis.com. Uh, and you'll see, uh, also there's a link to Judy's blog. She has her own uh, webpage, beautifulgracenotes.com. And uh, what else do we need Your to... Your speaking schedule is in there Speaking schedule. the coming month. Going back to Texas this, uh, this Sunday. Sunday. This mm -hmm. Sunday. So we'll have a... we got a full full week coming up ahead and rick's messages are on the audio as well in the uh, on the web website rickmanis.com right and all of uh, our books are there our products um i guess that's it i think so all right happy tuesday happy ricktober guys have a good night thanks for being with us